The Peace Studies Institute of Spokane Community College presents authors Dr. Scott Finney and Professor Angela Davis Wisner in a dialogue, Unlocking the Master Narrative. Our second episode, Living Indigenous. Our guest for today's panel is Alma Tomeo. Alma Tomeo is a descendant of the Yakima Nation, Nez Perce Tribe, and is an enrolled member of the Colville Confederated Tribes. Her family moved to Spokane from Wapato, Washington in 1971. In 1979, Alma reigned as Miss Indian Spokane. Her mother, Rose Tomeo, was well known for her artistic ability to make beautiful Native American regalia. Throughout her lifetime, Rose was politically active in tribal affairs, teaching Alma the rich history of her people, the importance of public speaking, and community involvement. The Tomeo lineage, originally Tamul Maxmax, has been thoroughly involved in tribal issues for many generations, as the Tomeos are direct descendants of Chief Tamul Maxmax, Tomeo Kamiakan. Thank you for joining us today, our history and communications podcast. And this is our second episode on Living Indigenous. And I think we're going to have a very, uh, I would say, intriguing conversation with our special guest, Alma Tamio. And you know, the history uh, in the United States of oppression has very, I would say, very uh, dimensionals, uh, dimensional levels that go up and down. And the indigenous people in this country have really uh, taken on a certain level of oppression that I think we get to open up and see from a personal history, uh, mainly through the boarding schools, which started in 1860. Actually, the first one was in Yakima uh, here in Washington. And uh, the boarding schools were, was a means of the government bringing about a forced assimilation upon the indigenous people in this country. And so today we'd like to enter into your personal history of mm -hmm. how the boarding school uh, experience was. And, Alma, for our first question, uh, take us with you, if you could, historically, in your own personal story. What was it like that first night that you were in a boarding school? Uh, let's say, left alone in your bed, and what was going through your mind? What, what was going on as you were in this new situation against your will? Well, actually, um, the, the boarding school that I attended was uh, then called uh, St. Mary's Mission in Omak, Washington, and uh, when, when when I went to school there, uh, I went in seventh and eighth grade, and uh, it was uh, by choice, and so um, I wasn't ordered to go there. My cousins attended there, mm -hmm. and had in, and had asked my mom uh, if I could come to school there, and. And I was excited about it. And uh, by the time I got there, um, I spent uh, part of my seventh grade year there and eighth grade. And so, although there, of course, because uh, you're, the children are all away from their their homes, you're living in a dormitory situation. Um, they had the big girls dorm and the little girls dorm. And then they had the big boys' dorm and the little uh, boys' dorm. So um, when I lived there, it was in the 70s, and uh, we it was still Catholic run. Ran. We had to uh, attend the church on uh, on like uh, I think it was like Thursday and Sunday, and so uh, we were we were still in in to uh, the learning the Catholic um, religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they did still have the priests there. And um, my, some of the children who, who did attend there um, came from homes that were not, um, I guess, functional, you know, uh, homes. And so they were dysfunctional and so the children might have been court ordered there. And um, so I, and, and, and this is my feelings. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, a lot of times that predators can sense who 
they would prey upon. And, and uh, so some of the children who attended from a younger age on up to the highest at that particular boarding school was seventh, eighth grade. And so uh, I'd say like within the last 10 years, uh, one of uh, the boys who I grew to uh, be really good friends with while I attended there, we remained friends um, over the years and through high school, we both went to uh, to another boarding school, which was called Chamawa Indian School, and um, we were friends, really close friends there. And uh, so, when they started questioning the people, because people were beginning to come out and and uh, get lawyers and uh, pursue the cases against the Catholic Church for the abuse, um, even. The gentleman who who entered into as one of those um, cases, um, they eventually won their cases, but it was ongoing. And I remember he had confided in me and the things, and even who had been his abusers. And he was there at a younger age than I was, and I was there by choice. Um, when he returned home for. Uh, summers, it would be his uh, grandma who he lived with uh, because, um, uh, again, this is, this is my theory of, you know, what causes a lot of trauma often in even um, victims like, you know, they have the MMIW, the, it started out the missing, uh, murdered and missing indigenous women and has sent since um, came to where they are now including the the males and the children of uh, the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so um, with that, um, he, he my, my friend, my very close friend who I'm still friends with, and um, he, he won his case and it was according to the type of trauma and I guess longevity of the abuse mm -hmm. that they were awarded. Um, and I had another friend of my brother's who attended that school and, I, and I'm not sure if it was the same two schools, but he won too. And they were both from the Caldwell Reservation. And um, I think a lot of that uh, when you have children who are abused, end up um, not knowing how to deal with their trauma and become um, alcoholics or drug users, or maybe uh, they've never learned how to treat a, a wife or even how to treat their own brothers and sisters mm -hmm. because they're in a system mm -hmm. that has you know, pretty much you all go together, you go to class, you go to study hall, you go to breakfast, dinner, lunch, and have certain amounts of time for free time, you know. So it's really institutionalized, and so uh, often you'll have the individuals who get used to the institutional life, and uh, once they realize, um, it's cold in the winter or fall, whatever, and then they they find that when they're put into jail, again that's the same institutionalized living mm -hmm. that they've already become accustomed mm -hmm. to, and mm -hmm. so I not think, much of a change, huh? Yeah, so not I think much of a so that physical abuse that you mentioned, mm -hmm. as a communication uh, focus. Did you hear any verbal abuse? It sounds like you had an okay experience, but the people around you, it sounds like had some tough times. Were there ever any verbal messages sent to you or the kids in the boarding school that made you feel less than or, or hurt your self-esteem as an indigenous person? Well, um, like 
society, I guess, was evolving into the the system of uh, people bringing lawsuits against mm -hmm. uh, different institutions, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. schools, especially, and and so I I've mentioned this to my children that uh, the today's society, even what happened to me, and and I grew up in a really strict home, and my mom never allowed drugs or alcohol in or around our home or anybody who was mm -hmm. using it. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a really, I never spent the night with my friends, you know, growing up until that point when I went to the boarding school. So I was really surprised that I was allowed to go to that yeah. boarding school. But while I was there, um, a group, I have 12 brothers and sisters, and so, um, you get pretty strong and tough being in a large family like yes, that. You yes. know? So when I went to the boarding school, the other kids kind of challenged me and, um, you know, I had to fight. I had to fight two or three uh, different girls before I guess I proved myself. You were ready with the 12 but, brothers and sisters. Yeah, <laughs> but at one point, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I, I won't say what I did, but I got myself in trouble. <laughs> wasn't very nice what I did and I uh, this little girl told on me and so the principal she used to wear cowboy boots and um, she came looking for me everybody was telling me she's looking for you and so I said okay so my thinking I'm thinking where's the best place to hide okay I'm gonna go to the infirmary so I went to the infirmary there were I knew there were because I used to go on their visit some of the sick kids I sat between the two uh, cabinets where they keep the medicine, put pulled the little stool in between. And then uh, she, I heard her boots coming down the hall and she looked in the infirmary. She left, she came back and she finally said, have you guys seen Elma Tomio? And I said, and they said, uh, somebody said, oh, she's sitting right there. And I'm like, huh. I knew, you know, she told me, come on. We, we went to the you. office and all my friends seen me go in there. And uh, she asked me if I did that, and I didn't deny what I did. I said, yes, I did. And she says, okay, bend over. Oh, boy. And so uh, what she used to hit me with, and this was in the 70s, she had me bend over and touch my toes, and it's a, a black horse whip. Horse whip. And she, I, she was like, you know, You've seen people. Was, is that common in the boarding school? I. It was common at uh, at my boarding school, and uh, a horse whip. Yeah, and so I I I got several lashings, but I was I was real stubborn, and uh, I wouldn't cry. I, she stood me up, and said, asked me a couple questions. I'd answer her questions before, of course. I, I got the whipping. But after I just stood there and just looked at her and she says, get out of here and go to uh, study hall. And I walked out, but I wouldn't say anything to her. But when I went around the corner, I started crying. My friends were, did not go to uh, study hall. They were waiting for me. And so um, I was used to being open and honest with my mom. I told my mom what happened and uh, told her what I did. And um, my mom went in there, she knew her. She went to the same boarding school with her, this lady who was now the principal. Uh, my mom was in the um, generation where they were forcibly taken out of the home. Oh, your mom was. My mother was. And, uh, and my mom, <clears throat> when my mom went there, she, uh, was like uh, seven, six, seven years oh, old. Oh, so young. Yeah, so she Did they was, take her out of her home? They took her uh, from my mother. They took my mother and she had uh, a, an older, two older sisters and um, an older brother that went. And then there were, uh, a, there was a younger sister and two younger brothers who did not have to go because my mom was the last one who was forcibly taken from the home. Wow. And um, 
this was the era when the when uh, a lot of the abuse was going on from um, from what I've heard and and again I, I said you know I don't know how factual some of this is because this was not my your first primary person but my mother um, and I've heard the question asked that what school has a uh, graveyards right there at the school and so um, the boarding schools all had the, the graveyards. Well, if you're taking other people's children and they're attending these boarding schools, if there's a death, don't you think they'd be returned to their family? Oh Scott, what about that historically? You know, along those lines, I wanted to ask you, um, over, well, they say close to 250 grave sites have been recovered from indigenous families, uh, I guess across the country. But part of the reason they did that was because the thought was boarding schools are to bring the Indian, American Indian, indigenous people into an assimilated state where they blend into civilization. Right. And in other words, get stripped of who they are and what they know. Mm -hmm. Now, along that line, when you were there, even though you went there you know, by your own free will, the thought, the theme is, the overruling theme is Kill the Indian, save the man. Obnoxious, it's very uh, dehumanizing. At any point did you feel like you were being denied who you are or you were being told to be different than what you knew you were and being mm. raised by your mom and all? Was there any conflict, difficulty that you can relate to? Um, well, okay, so how I mentioned that when I went, it was in the 70s. Mm. When my mom was there, it was in the 30s and 40s, so oh. there was a big difference in the in the uh, motives. Yeah. And like you said, the assimilation. Um, there's a simulation, and then there's a cultural assimilation, and then there's cultural uh, cultural uh, extinction. Mm -hmm. Extinction. Mm -hmm. So there's the two, mm -hmm. and um, so. I think that uh, the the assimilation was a part of taking them out of the home because they were told the parents were told do not speak the language, do not practice the religion, mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to. And uh, then there was uh, them having to say the. Uh, rosaries or the prayers that they expected them to learn mm -hmm. and memorize and in my mom's writings I remember um, her saying um, when she thinks back to it uh, she would remember she would think <clears throat> of hearing like a bee's nest and you hear them mm -hmm. and she'd say just to repeat it in the mass mm -hmm. number of little kids trying to memorize the same thing and then they're all there and just reminded her of, of like a bee's nest. And so again, some of the children were uh, abused and even killed back in those days. I forget the, the number up in Canada that they've come up with is like over 9,000 mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, Deborah Holland, who, um, when you look at it, we've had black senators black people already entered years ago into the uh, government system. Mm -hmm. It's the first time in Biden's cabinet that we've ever had uh, a right. uh, uh, Department of uh, Interior Secretary mm -hmm. Deborah Holland. Yes. yes. Our first one. That's right. Within these first months, three months, she um, initiated the MMIW then following uh, the uh, boarding schools, mm -hmm. like I think it was like three months later. And, um, and just today, uh, within all along, I mean, we, you'll see our chiefs from, I, I said I was Yakima, Colville, Nespers, um, and, uh, Flathead 
However, we just started enrolling in the 1930s. Hmm. So if you, like my grandpa, my mom's dad, he was from the, it's called Flathead Reservation. We didn't have all these titles and, hmm. and uh, we, were, we were traveling people. Hmm. We didn't stay stationary. And so um, my mom, her dad came from the Flathead Reservation, but in the 1930s when they started enrolling the uh, Native American people, he was enrolled as a Colville for force. And so um, before when my, uh, when his mother came from the uh, Yakima Reservation, when they enrolled for force, but but my family comes from the chiefs, like I mentioned, you know, we come from the chiefs. And so especially the chiefs would be trading wives and with the different surrounding tribes. Mm -hmm. And so um, well, one thing I did want to bring out though, uh, with the boarding schools, mm -hmm. um, that to that is uh, my, my, my mom was a um, little girl when she was there found favor in one of the not, not, uh, nuns. And um, an interesting uh, piece that I always held dear to about my mother was she she spoke uh, Salish in her home before she was taken. When she got there, they were teaching the English in the, in the school system. Mm -hmm. When they went back to the dorms, the nuns were were German. So here she's learning in the school, she's learning English. In the dorms, she's learning German. And so one of the nuns found favor in my mom and began to give her different big dresses and a doll and started teaching her how to sew. And so that's how my mom be began to learn uh, to work with her hands, to uh, make doll clothes for her dolls. Mm -hmm. And um, so from there, um, you know, in every situation, everything's not gonna be bad. And my mom didn't experience the type of uh, abuse mm -hmm. a lot of the other kids did, you know. And so uh, then when she went home, she, her neighbors, they, oh, here, here's some, big dresses and she'd make them smaller for herself, clothes. And and then my grandma started teaching her how to be, you know, how to do different things. And so my mom uh, always was working with her hands. And um, in my family, we, we didn't lose any of the cultural um, aspects of our, our life. And, it's beautiful. And, uh, That's excellent. Mm -hmm. And then some of my cousins, um, were stubborn and, and would not stop the religions and would not stop speaking in the privacy of their homes and mm -hmm. their language. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't, in my home, speak fluent of all the uh, different languages. However, we did take pieces of the languages from the call, or the, it's not called call, it's called like Okanagan Salish and the different Salish, the Sahaptan, the um, Cow, uh, Cowlitz they call uh, jargon and the different languages. Uh, we spoke bits and pieces and, and I could tell you different, how to say a white person in three, four languages of the different wow. Indian different because, tribal. Yeah, because they didn't languages. all speak the same. Sure. Hmm. And then even up into Canada, there's different dialects, so. Um, Good to know from a communication perspective, when people think of indigenous language, they mm -hmm. don't realize how important it is and how some universities are making a point to keep them alive. Before we move on to your beautiful regalia, tell us a little bit about MMIW so the students know what's going on. Okay, well, um, the MMIW, uh, well, 
according to how how um, many Native Americans, white, black, Hispanic, uh, Mexican, um, or Spanish, um, there are in America per capita. The women who are murdered in America is is high percentage more than mm -hmm. other races. Mm -hmm. And so they came out with this uh, MMIW, which is Murdered Missing Indigenous Women. And so instead of having cold cases, they it, 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 now, since Deborah Holland's in there, have those cases all opening up. And so they're active cases. And so, um, so that's how that started. And then they uh, later included the, the the men, the Indian men, because they're missing they're, too, right? Exactly. The children as well. Yes, and yes. there are children, and uh, I've I've looked at those. I know one girl who was a friend of mine out of uh, Coeur d'Alene Res, who. Um, is on that list, and uh, another friend of mine, he's a male from the Spokane Res, and so um, reservation for sure. And um, so they they've opened these cases up, and so they're actively assigning uh, them to not only just tribal, but including the mm -hmm. uh, you know like different levels of law local, uh, federal, federal law. And so they're uh, actively seeking why these uh, people are turning up murdered. And, and so- Historically, um, has this been going on oh boy, for a long time? It sure has. You know, what it sounds like you've gotten the uh, institutionalized uh, oppression that wasn't as intense as, as for your mom and so on. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, and I, I wanted to ask you this question, when you consider who you are and where you come from, what has been the struggle to hold on to your identity, to hold on to your culture personally? What have you done? Uh, obviously, in your beautiful attire, there's an expression there. Mm -hmm. But what have you done to retain that which makes you who you are as a, as a people? Well, yourself, what have you done? Um, my my uh, children, when they grew up, mm -hmm. Uh, my mother and I would have them um, practice about three, even four times a week, three times a week mm -hmm. mostly. And then we'd give them a day off because on the weekend we'd bring them to Palos. And so, mm -hmm. so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they'd be dancing. So we'd give them like the day before, the day after. Oh. Then we, and so. Whenever they uh, did the the physical tests at their schools, they were always maxed out. They were always in top physical condition. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, that next generation, you're passing it on. Yes, and so so Native Americans are so collective that it doesn't end with one generation. Your strength comes from looking back. Yes, and now you're putting it forward with your kids. Yes. Now tell us about your beautiful regalia. Um, this, Every bit of it is beautiful. Yes, I hope everybody is. gets a chance this to see it. This is called a, a shell dress. And uh, the last time I came, I wore a wing dress. Mm -hmm. And it's basically the same, except for it's just only material. And I love uh, it these, so much. Yeah. These are little shells themselves. Shells, yes. And uh, I began uh, beading when I was like eight years old. And so um, I, I watched my mom bead. And then my uncle uh, used to make bustles. And uh, he said, my grandma started me off by making little miniature uh, moccasins. Oh, how and then, wonderful, yeah. cute. <laughs> so, but my uncle, I, I was watching and I was looking at the, um, bustle and I said I'd like to make one of them and he said the bustle and I said well I'd like to make a bustle but I'd like to make and I was pointing at the little medallion that was in the middle of the bustle and he said you want to make a but, uh, medallion I said yes I would and he, and he 
set me up and he says, okay, we're gonna start you off with a, a, a little uh, a medicine wheel. Okay. And then he taught me the significance of the medicine wheel. And then so I, that was my first, first bead of peas. And uh, in our way, uh, your first, like your, your first uh, beadwork, your first, uh, whatever you do first, you give it away. And uh, your first kill, but you find somebody who's inspirational or somebody who's doing just that, passing those kind of, uh, kind of uh, craftsmanship to the next generation. Next generation. And so that's how, how um, that works is, is you honor somebody because they honor the younger generation. That's beautiful. So indigenous people are super connected to the to nature and the earth. Yes. The earth is your mother. Yes. And interesting that you say that because um, the one of the tribes I belong to is the Yakima Reservation. They're uh, they're a, a treaty and a tribe. They signed the treaty. The chiefs signed the treaty. Uh, my grandpa, uh, the Kamaikan, was the first signer on the treaty. The Colville tribe, which is what I'm enrolled, was an uh, executive order. And so hmm. there's differences in them, but the treaty still both said as long as the sun rises, the rivers flow, the grass grows, you can uh, have these different rights. That's Which beautiful. Being fishing, hunting, um, gathering roots, and and uh, and, and a part of uh, like he said that simulation is uh, when they when they take over. On, on a, a people, they'll they'll strip them of their language, they'll strip them of their religion, their cultural, and uh, in that are the foods, you know. And uh, our people would would dig the roots, and uh, to this day, they try to wipe that out of our existence, which is what I, I, I oh. mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and today, a lot of that is being revived. And um, I had mentioned uh, when I when I originally heard that about the questions, mm -hmm. uh, the boarding schools. And I said, <laughs> well, you know, my experience was good. My mom's wasn't tragic, although other people's were, you know, and uh, so often all, all, everything about the, a situation isn't always tragic. Sure. That's very sure. good advice. And we, yeah, yeah, and we, we appreciate that. You know, right. I wish we could sit here for a few hours yeah. and chat with you. We appreciate yeah. the fact that you, as, you and your family and as a people have flourished and made it through right. uh, the, the extinction and the assimilation culturally. Mm -hmm. You know, what we'll do now is we'll, we'll transition uh, mm -hmm. and then maybe turn it over to the students before they need oh, to okay. leave. But I, I should appreciate, we should appreciate your your uh, story telling. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unique for us to hear mm -hmm. the, the truth of it all. Now, you know, at this point, what we like to do is transition to uh, what we call the spotlight section. And I think we have an important uh, individual, Angela, you'll tell us about. Chief Joseph is our focus today. That's who we are celebrating in the spotlight. Chief Joseph was a leader of the Wallowa Band of the Nez Perce Tribe, who became famous in 1877 for leading his people on an epic flight across the Rocky Mountains. In defiance of the government's, government's order to surrender and be subjected to a reservation in Idaho, with the federal troops' aggressive pursuit, he was finally forced to surrender. Yet, with the dignified utterance that still rings through history, he stated, Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From here the sun now stands. I will fight no more. 
forever. This Nez Perce chief is still a hero today because of his resiliency in fighting for he knew what was right. He was able to capture our hearts of his followers and of many Americans. That's beautiful, beautiful. You know, in, in closing, you know, we'd like to uh, pass on the good, good word that our ins inspiration comes from the indigenous people that are originally and initially. It's what it is to be American. And uh, I'd like to close with this quote from Sitting Bull uh, that uh, I think really wraps up a lot of what you just told us, Elmer, in your whole story. Sitting Bull, who was uh, alive from 1831 to 1890, he said, warriors are not what you think of as warriors. The warrior is not someone who fights because no one has the right to take another life. The warrior for us is one who sacrifices himself for the good of others. His task is to take care of the elderly, the defenseless, those who cannot provide for themselves, and above all, the children. Isn't that the truth? Huh? Mm -hmm. The future of humanity. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. On